Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for being here. My name is uh, John Laird. I'm a California State Senator from the 17th District in the Central Coast. I'm a former California Secretary for Natural Resources, and I'm part of a five-senator delegation that includes Senators Dave Min, Bob Wykowski, Bill Dodd, and Melissa Hurtado. Uh, when we were here, our delegation last year in Glasgow, we talked about all we had done in the state budget and uh, in the state legislature together with the governor on resilience. Last year, that's what we really did, whether it was fire prevention, uh, drought uh, resilience, sea level rise, but we did not have substantial forward movement on climate policy, <clears throat> legislatively, statutorily. This year, that was totally different. And one of the major reasons I'm here is to tell the story from California about the progress that we made in the last year. <clears throat> we passed a number of bills uh, to move ahead together with uh, $54 billion of expenditures toward fighting uh, climate change in our budget. Additionally, uh, we had an extension of the life of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, but leveraged extensive electricity from renewables in that effort. I want to go through some of these things and report what's going on in California. <clears throat> the centerpiece was codifying the previous executive order to say that we will be uh, a neutral in carbon emissions from California by 2045. Additionally, we adopted Senate Bill 1020, which sets interim goals toward that goal, saying that with electricity in our renewable portfolio, we'll be at 90% by 2035, we'll be at 95% uh, uh, by 2040. <clears throat> and the real idea is to jumpstart uh, we additionally did a bill that said by 2035, we will be carbon neutral in state operations. We did a bill about natural and working lands and how we will set goals in carbon neutrality uh, with that. So basically, we went issue by issue. On methane, uh, we acted to make sure that we step up uh, well capping California only put $5 billion to well capping a year, even though there's anywhere from 1,000 to 15,000 wells uh, that are out of use or temporarily not being used that need to be capped. Uh, five, billion, uh, doesn't get you, uh, 5 million doesn't get you very far. This year, we lifted the cap on the number of wells, added $100 million. And really want to, because that accounts for up to 13% of the methane that's released in California. Additionally, uh, Senate Bill 1383 was adopted a few years ago <clears throat> that says by 2030, we will have complete organics collection in the waste stream um, at the source throughout California. And last year, we jump started it with $70 million to go to local entities to do it. We added more this year so that we could attack methane, short-lived climate pollutants through our actions, whether it's well capping or on uh, organics reduction. Additionally, on the Senate side, uh, when we did not have major policy success last year, <clears throat> the Senate president appointed a 12-member climate working group. Uh, I was the chair, and the 12 senators cut across geography, cut across politics, cut across ethnicity, to be able to take everybody's individual interest of their district uh, uh, or their issues and harmonize them so that we could actually move legislation. And it meant that a key part of it is equity. And a key part of it is high road labor agreement. In addition to a key part being the specific things on the ground we might do for some of the transitions in our goals for electricity. <clears throat> for example, with electric vehicles, uh, uh, we really tried in the Clean Cars for All program to expand it so that people that normally can't afford electric vehicles can afford it. 
we removed the sales tax on that program for the collection of vehicles until 2028. Uh, we attempted to do many things because there's electricity islands in parts of urban California, and there's electricity islands and multifamily units and other places, so that if we're truly going to transition to electric cars, they have to be affordable, the electricity has to be there, <clears throat> we have to incent to meet our goals for clean cars. We worked hard and got a lot closer with legislation on doing that this year. Uh, additionally, uh, for the first time, we had no framework for carbon sequestration. And the governor proposed money in the budget, and we adopted a bill that set goals, time frames, and a structure <clears throat> for carbon sequestration uh, to begin in California. And it meant not with enhanced oil recovery, uh, because we did not want to tie it to fossil fuel extraction, and that bill, which had really been hard to pass, also was passed this year. On the budget side, in the $54 billion, $10 billion alone was to electric vehicles to do some of the things I talked about. But if it's, we cross this year 1 million electric vehicles in California. We have to have millions more by 2030 to try to meet our climate goals. And so to try to have money to do the things on the ground that facilitate that movement was part of this year's <clears throat> legislative and budget action. We also had money for uh, demand side grid support. Uh, we went through and did many, many things budgetarily to try to move ahead on our uh, climate goals. I think one of the key things this year is the governor proposed extending the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant life. The plant was scheduled to close in 2025. It is the only remaining nuclear power plant in California. It, it generates 9% of the electricity base load uh, on our entire grid in California. <clears throat> it was controversial, but it was our goal to do many things with it acquire the 12,000 acres of ecologically sensitive lands, don't overrule the Coastal Commission, don't pay back transition money, make sure there's seismic safety, uh, much more. But the key part is, is that I called and others called for a Marshall Plan for Renewable Electricity. That Diablo Canyon bill created $1.1 billion for renewable electricity to jumpstart it in California. Because if in fact, our grid does not have a, enough electricity on a hot summer day at five o'clock in September, um, and that's the reason the Diablo nuclear power plant is going to be extended, we need that electricity whether the plant is extended or whether the plant is not extended. It is important to do. So it was a key part uh, of that to move ahead. And, the, and the, the key thing about it is, is if there is a Marshall Plan, we have to keep moving on the renewables. Last year, we adopted goals and facilitation for offshore wind. <clears throat> California does not have significant offshore wind at this time. The federal government is in the process of leasing. There's two places. There's Humboldt County, which is in the far north of California. <clears throat> There's San Luis Obispo, which is in the central coast. And in San Luis Obispo, that transmission that comes out of Diablo Canyon will be the key transmission to move the power from offshore wind onshore and into the California grid. So limiting the extension of Diablo Canyon to five years was important because it will move off just as the offshore wind is moving on, and it will be a transition to new renewable electricity, and the transmission will be there to move it reliably onto the grid. And it is significant that all these things in the aggregate were taken together this year. And so the key part of this will be, what are the next steps to implementation? Uh, the Diablo Canyon deal said, 
that the Energy Commission will look at that $1.1 billion and prioritize what is doable, what produces the most, what might leverage the most in matching funds, and make sure that the energy that we kickstart as part of that deal is uh, energy that really brings other things to it and that we do the most efficient, most effective, uh, most cost effective in a priority order in moving ahead. And the Energy Commission is moving ahead on doing that. We had a 10 day heat wave in California in September that stressed our grid dramatically. And we had lessons that we learned that we can apply to these very things that we were just doing in the budget and with legislative action. One is, is that for key hours at the time of the highest use of electricity on the grid, battery storage, um, which generated in those key hours one and a half times roughly the electricity of Diablo Canyon, kept our grid up and kept it from collapsing in that period of time. So battery storage is very, very important as part of the global solution in California. And in my own district, it is part of the change in the transition to renewables. In Moss Landing, in Monterey County, a former fossil fuel plant is now a battery storage plant. It uses the transmission to move uh, electricity onto the grid. In Morro Bay, which is a former fossil fuel plant, there's major uh, projection and plans for battery storage that will use that uh, transmission and move on to the grid. And then Diablo Canyon uh, eventually will phase out and the offshore wind will use that transmission so that we're taking historic energy provision from fossil fuels and nuclear and switching to wind and battery storage with the transmission that exists there. And so that battery storage was key and more battery storage is key. We also had a huge debate during Diablo Canyon and the discussion in the legislature about what to consider for demand response in the time of those heat waves. And it was argued that you can't rely on the public necessarily to make the kind of cuts to keep the grid up to do that. And the administration was instrumental at a key moment when it looked like the grid at the end of one day was in danger of rolling uh, brownouts. And 2.7 text messages were sent out and within a half hour, the demand on Cal in California dropped. And so it was a statement that demand response works. It's one of those things that you can't do more than two or three times, uh, probably in a given year at that level, but it shows that you can do it and the public will respond. So it was a very significant part of what we learned uh, out of that crisis. So what are the next steps? Now the next steps are really implementation. We did the goals. And, and for a moment on the goals, uh, I was in the legislature in 2006 when we adopted the first landmark uh, piece of legislation with regard to climate change and goals, uh, Assembly Bill 32. And, and basically, our federal government was in the process of walking away from the Kyoto Protocols, and AB 32 took the Kyoto Protocols and put them on California. It said basically by 2020, we would return to the emissions level of 1990. And we met that goal with a couple of years to spare. And what that bill did is it didn't specify what all the cuts were. It gave the authority to the Air Board, it, uh, both to regulate and financing, and let them do it. And so that is how we got there. And in 2011, Governor Brown signed the bill that said we would move to 33% renewables in our electricity portfolio by 2020. We met that goal early. And so when we were having the debate on the 2045 uh, goal on the floor of the Senate, one of the few opponents stood up and said, there's no specificity here. 
And, and it was my response that that is exactly what was said during the passage of AB 32. And we met those goals in exactly the same way. That wasn't a relevant point. <clears throat> and so now we have the implementation. And it's not just those goals. I mean, the one that I also refer to is that we adopted a goal about 30 years ago that said we would divert 50% from our landfills. And I was a mayor at the time and thought, great goal, it'll never happen. And then we diverted uh, up until the pandemic, 60% from the landfills. And so basically these goals really matter. These goals really spur action. But that is our, uh, among our next steps is to really move to the specific action that implements these goals. We have the 1.1 billion for renewable electricity. We have the money for well capping. We have different goals for natural and working lands, for uh, the, our state operations and making sure that we're carbon neutral by 2035. And we have to do everything, whether it's with electric vehicles in the transportation sector, whether it's with natural and working lands, which is providing much more offshore wind, providing much more renewable energy, expanding the grid to take all this energy on, to educate the public on what the change will be with demand response and when to use electricity, to expand battery storage so that in fact, if we do generate it at times that people don't need it, we have a way to store it and even out the grid for reliability. We have all those implementation actions as the next steps. But I think this year we moved dramatically ahead in funding a lot of those next steps, in setting the goals. And now it's our obligation to really organize the people of California toward meeting those goals with specific implementation actions and continue the leadership and success we've had in meeting goals and move to that level of carbon neutrality before it's too late. Uh, with that, in the remaining time, I would be happy if there are any questions to uh, answer those questions. We do have a question, but I think we have a dead mic. No, I can't. You're going to have to move closer if you're going to shout it. Hello? OK, there. thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned using uh, tweets on Twitter to um, ask people to use less power, and it, and it worked. Uh, very effectively. So what are you going to do if there's no Twitter anymore? Do you have a contingency plan? <laughs> well, actually, I have some colleagues that are actively trying for there not to be Twitter anymore. Uh, uh, um, and it, we will find a way. We will find a way, whether it's reverse directories on phones, whether it's through television, radio, any rapid uh, uh, method of communication we will do because that has to work and, and we have to make it work because we, we saw how successful it was this time. Any other questions? Well, Senator, first of all, let me thank you for your in incredible leadership on all of these many topics. Mm -hmm. Many of these things would not have happened if it wasn't for your leadership. Uh, the governor, as you know, has called us back to a special session uh, the first week of December to discuss a uh, oil severance or oil extraction tax. A lot of that has been framed around the, the cost of gas and the profits associated with oil companies. What, how does that fit into our broader uh, climate goals? Uh, what impact will it have? And if we do get this money, how should we use it? Uh, the person that asked that question didn't identify himself, but it's Assembly Member Matt Haney from San Francisco, for the record. And the Speaker <clears throat> and the Senate President said when the governor called for special session, and at the time he called it, it was two months hence, 
which would be in early December, that they anxiously await his detailed proposal. And I think all of us do, because the problem is clear. They're incredible windfall profits at a time when budgets are stretching to be able to afford gas at a time when our climate programs really need uh, funding. <clears throat> and at a time when we're trying to put pressure on, on taking less fossil fuel out of the ground. So I think the structure has to meet exactly the goals that you said. And, and it's interesting because California is one of the few states does not have an oil extraction tax. And, <clears throat> and the, the oil companies have always argued if they were here, they would say, we pay property tax, we pay sales tax, we pay all these other taxes. But that doesn't seem to dent the massive profits in a time of trouble that they were receiving. So I think <clears throat> it's gonna have to address that and address that in a way that it's not gonna automatically be passed on to the consumer. And I think that's gonna be the challenge in whatever the proposal is, is trying to figure out how to guarantee that that happens. But um, you nailed the issues of what we have to do. <clears throat> Can you please talk next about what's next for the state of California? What do they have to do to meet their goals? What are you going to do? I think the, the, uh, that's a very good question. And I think what the state has to do to meet the goals is continue, we have to expand the grid. Because if we meet our goals in electricity, we would have to expand the grid two or three times. And the process isn't always easy. We really need to implement that plan to expand the grid. And this year, there was a big problem in siting transmission and other projects in that the three main agencies, the Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Commission, and the California Independent System Operator, Cal ISO, couldn't share confidential information. And the legislature this year passed legislation that allowed that to happen for easier siting and, and speedier sighting of what we have to do. And, and, and we are leaving some energy on the table in some places. We are going to have to figure out how to expand battery storage to get to the reliability <clears throat> that we need. Uh, one of the hard arguments about against nuclear power is that it's 24-7 base load, it doesn't modulate. Once it kicks up for a week, it just stays at that level for a week. Well, if we're going to replace it with other power and replace fossil fuel, which could be burnt in any time, we have to have the reliability measures that are built in. <clears throat> so if, if the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and it's not at night, we have to have battery storage or other storage <clears throat> to even it out for the reliability of the grid. And then you have to deal with just a plain expansion of electricity that we need. And for some of us, um, Assemblymember Haney has a completely urban district. I represent the Santa Cruz Mountains where there were outages by the power company really regularly this year just due to basic system issues. And people from there came to me and said, Really, you want us to depend on our water provision. You want us to charge our batteries. We have fires where we have to escape and you want the electricity to be down where we can't charge our transportation or have water. So there's a whole issue of reliability of the grid if we're gonna to transition to electricity. And there is also one issue with battery storage because there was a very small fire in Moss Landing <clears throat> at the Tesla a battery storage plant where Highway 1 was closed for most of the day. There was a cloud that was moving. People were sheltering in place and ordered to shelter in place. And so I think we need the storage because we saw that the grid would have gone down without it, but we need to assure people that it's safe. So this year we might need to take action in the legislature that guarantees a fire plan or a safety plan because in order to convince people that we should move ahead with storage, we have to convince them and show them it's safe. <clears throat> I believe it is, but nevertheless, 
this is convincing the public of doing it. And so I think that may well be further action that we have to take in this session. Yes, no? There, ah, we, there go. we go. Um, I was wondering if you could um, uh, expand a little bit on your thinking on the um, legislation relating to well capping in California. Does that legislation incentivize the right things with regard to capping of uh, abandoned and orphaned wells? And is the money that is being put toward it enough, in your opinion? It, that's a good question because actually the money isn't enough for the total amount that we have to do, but we'll make more progress on it than we have in recent years tenfold. But it ra your question is exactly right <clears throat> because we're going to have to make sure that the, the CalGEM department, the department that regulates oil and gas, can scale up to handle this. And I think that's going to be a challenge over the short term. <clears throat> the, we did not have the state assembly adopt uh, our high road labor agreement for labor protections for the biggest environmental projects fighting climate change. But we were able to take those high road labor agreements and incorporate them into the well capping bill. <clears throat> and so I think that will help make that happen in many ways. But we're going to have to scale it up. We might have to figure out how to prioritize uh, which ones we move on. And there's some projects that are really small. So for the purposes of the high road labor agreement, we bunch them together so that it would be critical mass enough that you could get to the labor protections in doing the well capping. So it's the reason I say implementation is the next step. And as you can see, we've given the tools for that to happen. Now we have to make sure it actually happens and in an orderly way and one that accomplishes our goals.